I want to welcome everyone to Chatham County Cooperative Extension's Farm Tax Webinar on Schedule F Income. Guido, uh, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, and greetings and hello to everybody. Uh, I see we've got about 40 folks online uh, thus far, and I hope that uh, last week was pretty good. One of the things that uh, Debbie and I talked about last week, and I just want to give you a little bit of a background. We had a little bit of a pre-web uh, webinar survey for Schedule F. I was just curious as to how folks were organized, uh, because sometimes that allows me to maybe tailor the comments. Uh, the first one was, how do you operate your business? And 50% of the respondents were sole proprietors. But 45% uh, were as an LLC. Now, we just did that as um, a broad question. So they, those could be a single member LLC, which would file essentially as a sole proprietor, but with limited liability. Uh, it could be a partnership, or they could have also made the election to be treated as a as a corporation. We didn't get that detailed. And then uh, about 4% of the people that responded were operating as a partnership. And it was uh, overall, there were some commodity uh, production, looking at row crops, small grains, and livestock. That was 25%. 66% of the, of the folks were horticultural crops. 25% also had value-added products. So they were looking at doing a... a, a a two business model, and we'll talk a little bit about that because that's come up in a couple of the questions that we had. Then some were venue marketing, looking at agritourism and weddings, and then there were some others. Uh, and the, in the other category, they said bees, honey, eggs, um, and and some of those other other type of things as well. So I found that interesting, and thank you for responding to that because that do, does help a little bit. Uh, and as Debbie said, uh, I did provide some written answers to the questions, and I hope to cover those. So with all that said, kind of a little bit of a groundwork, we're going to spend tonight, uh, the next two hours or so, hour and, and uh, 50 minutes, looking at Schedule F, and it's going to be part one, which we basically are seeing here on the screen in the left-hand side. And we'll talk about those those items, and it looks like, you know, well, Vanderhoven, can you talk that along on nine nine line items? Well, uh, Debbie thinks I can do the job and with sufficient time for questions, and, and we'll move forward. But what I want to do first, because I don't know how, whether everybody was online, but I just want to review defining farm and farming, looking at defining who a farmer or a rancher is, and then we move into from the tax perspective. And my entire presentation, the focus of the presentation, is essentially going to be on Schedule F, looking at the tax side. Now, because North Carolina also has an income tax, and they piggyback to the feds, so whatever is reported on the federal return as farm income slides over and then is reported as part of taxable income total on North Carolina. You don't file a Schedule F for the North Carolina return because you're just pulling the taxable income numbers from uh, your federal return, individual return 1040, uh, or over from a 1065, which would be a partnership return, onto the North Carolina partnership return. But we want to look at all of that and just, again, set that baseline Make sure that we have a firm understanding that's what the focus is going to be. And then looking at income sources, and that's going to be our line by line discussion as we find it numerically on Schedule F. So let's set the baseline. What's a farm? And, and again, I don't mean to be uh, condescending or anything, but a farm is a business uh, in the eyes of the tax world, specifically the Internal Revenue Service and the North Carolina Department of Revenue. It is a business that has a profit motive. That does not necessarily mean that you're making a profit, but it has a profit motive, and we want to make sure that we are operating in a business-like manner. You might recall last week's conversation where we were very sensitive to, well, is it a hobby? And one of the hobby loss things we think about is if there's sub substantial losses year in and year out, 
can we defend ourselves? And there was a list of, of those items that IRS would look to and say, okay, you're, a, you're conducting yourself in a business-like manner. Uh, you're attending meetings such as this. And so, as I said last week, I'll, tell, I'll say it now for this presentation, I would put it in my diary that this is what I attended on, on February the 19th. And we looked at farm income and, and what's there. Now, the definition that you see there on the screen on the left, it comes directly from Internal Revenue Code Section 2032, Cap A, E4. And it basically is a definition of a farm for tax purposes that includes livestock production, dairy production, poultry, fish, fur, fruit, and truck farms, also including plantations, ranches, ranges, orchards, and groves. So if you fit yourself there, I mean, if you're growing cherries, you would be a fruit farm. If you're growing wheat, then you're going to be uh, growing uh, commodities of, of that nature. So that's what a, what a farm is. Then where some of the questions that I received, we're looking at what is farming and what we do with that. Well, farming is the, are the activities. They're the conduct of this agricultural enterprise. And again, we get uh, from the same place that we would see that as code section 2032 cap A E4. And this is where we see it's the cultivating the soil or raising and harvesting agricultural or horticultural commodities, which includes raising, shearing. I had a couple of questions about uh, an individual that uh, had sheep. So the shearing of one's own sheep is a farming activity. The shearing of a neighbor's sheep, that is more in the line of being a contracted service or a uh, machine hire, if you will, and think about it in that context. You're doing that for somebody else, not on your own animals. And so this is all in the context of what is it that you are doing with your assets and with your the commodities and that sort of thing. Caring, training, and management of animals. Then we also see the handling, drying, packing, grading, or storing on a farm, any agricultural or horticultural commodity. And the key phrase here is this last three words, in the unmanufactured or natural state. So if you think about it, I'm going to use a sweet potato example. If we harvest sweet potatoes, they're very uh, moist when they, when they come out of the ground. They need to be cured. We need to bring that moisture down to 12% or lower so they can be stable for the market, for transportation to the local uh, grocery stores, or if you're taking it to the farmer's market or wherever, they need to be cured. And so that's where the, the drying and the packing and the grading, that's all part of farming activity, but it's in the unmanufactured state. And last time we talked about meat, meat is a processed product it's value added. So it is not in the unmanufactured state because in the agricultural context, that would be the calf, that would be the, the market hog, that would be the market goat, that would be the lamb that's going uh, for lamb chops or leg of lamb, uh, th those kind of things, uh, that those live animals, those are the farm products, not the value added products. And then lastly, because North Carolina is covered with uh, about 60% with, with trees, that we have planting, cultivating, caring for, or cutting of trees, or preparing the trees for market. Those are all going to be the farming uh, broad definition. And this is just one of the definitions. Last week, I shared that for uh, folks, there are many definitions. It just depends on what specific purpose we are looking for. And I found these here to be very useful because they are very broad for this uh, as to provide a definition of what a farm or farming is. So if we look at what a farm is with farming, well then who's a farmer? Well, uh, Internal Revenue Service Publication 225, which is the farmer's tax guide, it defines a farmer or rancher as an individual who, quote, as you can see there on the screen as well, 
They're in the business of farming. If you cultivate, operate, or manage a farm for profit, either as an owner or a tenant, and we talked about that, and then the individual is going to file IRS Form 1041, uh, sorry, 1040, um, I'm bifocals here, uh, 1040, which is the individual income tax return. Schedule F, which is going to be the focus of tonight's presentation on the income side, that's going to be a supporting document, supporting schedule that says, here's how much money I took in, here are all my expenses, here's my net profit or my net loss, and then it moves over onto the 1040. Now, the definition, as we talked about last week, also applies to partnerships. If the partnership is engaged in doing a return uh, or doing farming activities, looking for that uh, profitable return, then they're going to be considered, that entity, that business entity, is going to be considered to be the farmer. That could also be an LLC that's taxed as a partnership, and they're going to use IRS Form 1065 to, to report their uh, profit or loss, and then they're going to use uh, Schedule F as a supporting schedule. Likewise, corporations could be the farmer. There's the C Corp, which is what I would refer to as the regular corporation, or the S Corporation, which is the small family uh, type corporation that's been set up. They're, they're very, very popular. Uh, and there are 11, and that would be either on uh, IRS Form 1120 or 1120S. If it's, a, if it's an S Corp, they're going to use the 1120S. And then estates and trusts can also be farmers, uh, the estate in transition where the decedent was a farmer, and now the estate has these farm assets, and they're going to continue to operate that farm until there is the final distribution of the decedent's material goods to whomever his or her beneficiaries would be. It could be that it goes to trust, and then the trust could be the farmer uh, in that case. So, it, But my focus tonight is going to be on Schedule F. I'm going to broadly presume that we're going to either be an individual, we're going to be a partnership, or we're going to be a corporation. Not too many estates and trusts, although there could be some that have those. Now, if we can come together and say, okay, I, I've got a pretty good handle on what farming is, then I've got to ask, well, the question or kind of define what farming it farming is not. Well, farming is not custom harvesting when it's operated as a service business. Here I've got a picture of a silage chopper uh, and they're going through uh, of an evening and they're they're chopping silage. And there's there's several folks. I worked with some folks in central North Carolina uh, that that was a major part of what their business. And they actually stood a separate uh, uh, harvesting company up to do that. It could also be trucking of farm commodities to market, again, as a service business. Custom farming as a service business. You're, uh, you are using, yes, agricultural assets, tractors, planters, discs, combines, all of those, those, those type of things, in, but it's in the context of providing that as a service. That's not farming because the operator does not have any economic interest in the crop that's being harvested except for his or her fees that they are producing. Now, one of the questions that uh, was raised uh, and it deals in this, and that is custom shearing of sheep. So uh, that individual had, uh, has raised a sheep, him or herself, and then does some custom shearing uh, around. That custom shearing uh, is a service business and would by rights go to a Schedule C for that, and that would be two sets of accounting records, one for the raising of the sheep, that's the Schedule F business, versus the Schedule C business, which is the custom shearing. And it could be, you know, you're charging so many dollars per head shorn uh, and, and how fast uh, you can do that. Uh, I've been in some shearing sheds in Australia and in New Zealand, and it's really uh, quite a show to see 12 or so um, 
shearers going at it uh, and uh, seeing those fleeces come off off of the off of the sheep. Processing of fruit commodities into value-added products. We talked at length about that last week, but again, just as a reminder, cheese, meat, wine, uh, those kind of things. It's not an all obviously not an all-inclusive list, but those are going to be value-added. Those are not farm products. Those are going to be a Schedule C product. So let's start looking at maybe some examples uh, here. The first one I've got is Rick. He operates a corn and soybean farm, generating long-term gross receipts of $750,000. Broadly, we could quickly say, yeah, Rick's a farmer. Uh, you know, that's, that's what we've got. We've got Ginger in contrast. She's got two specially constructed greenhouses in which she raises mushrooms. Now, she generates $25,000 in gross receipts and earns $10,000 in net profits. Now, Ginger is a farmer. Implicit here is that Ginger does have a profit motive, as you can see. And so in this case, scale, when you compare it to Rick, just in the previous example, it's not a factor. You got to look at what is Ginger doing? And, and some folks on the call may be saying, yeah, I can kind of relate to Ginger much better than I can relate to Rick. Well, the next one is we got Fish Inc. Uh, raising tilapia in ponds. Now the fish are harvested. They go to market as live fish because they're being shipped in special tanker trucks. Uh, and this is specifically for the fresh market. Uh, and this is uh, to meet a market demand for uh, a certain population. Um, it could be that these are going to New York or they could be going to Chicago, for example. But for IRS purposes, Fish Inc. would file a Schedule F to report its income and expenses from its fish farming business as a supporting document that goes along with IRS Form 1120S. Now, with a, when I just mentioned 1120S here, I'm saying Fish Inc. is a corporation, number one, but it is also a subchapter S corporation, closely held family type of corporation, but it is going to be the farmer where the shareholders, yes, they're out there feeding the fish, they're grading, they're harvesting, they're putting the fish into these special tanker trucks, they're providing the labor, but they would be shareholders' employees of the corporation. They're actually doing the har the 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 uh the agricultural farming work, but they are doing it as agents of the farmer, which in this particular case is Fish Inc. and it happens to be a corporation. Now the fourth one that I have here, this is just ABC LLC, and it rents all the land upon which it ra it, it raises uh, the row crops. Now, ABC is a three-member LLC, A, B, and C, just to keep it kind of simple. And it's engaged in the business of farming, even though it doesn't own any land. Remember back in that definition, you could own it as an operator or you could be as a tenant farmer. Well, here, ABC rents the land. ABC LLC is going to use Schedule F to report its income and expenses as a supporting document. And because we have three individuals that are members, it is a partnership. So we're going to use IRS Form 1065, uh, which is the partnership return to report that income. And, and, we, and we move uh, that through and that Schedule F still is very, very important because it also helps for both of these uh, last two examples to illustrate that these folks, the members of the LLC and the shareholder employees of the um, Corporation, Fish Inc., are going to qualify for any farmer type benefits that might accrue to them through the tax code. So we would have to see what is going to be their total gross income, and it would be prorated to them based on their equity position on either the corporation or in the LLC. And we would want to see that. Okay. So here, we'll just broadly introduce this, and, and we've talked about this, but this is the form, and I'm going to assume 
that most everybody is using cash method of accounting. Uh, there might be one or two that might use accrual, but in my almost now 40 years of experience, I've only had about four uh, farms that I personally have worked with over that time that used the accrual method. Everybody else was using the cash method. And so this is what the form looks like. It's the 2023 form that we have. And yes, the sole proprietor farm business is going to use Schedule F, which is the profit or loss from farming to report these income. But as I mentioned just a moment ago in those previous examples that we just looked at, Schedule F can also be used by partnerships, corporations, trusts, and estates to report this farming activity. And as we will see tonight and on Wednesday night, it kind of makes it easy because Schedule F uses the language of production agriculture for the reporting of the taxable income, okay? So line by line discussion is where we're going next. And again, I'm going to look at this from a farmer and rancher's perspective. My mindset is a sole proprietor, but some of my examples are going to be for uh, a partnership or an LLC or a single member LLC. We'll switch back and forth because I think that that is pertinent relative to the responses that we've had. But before I go on and jump into uh, the first part, are there any questions from the crowd? We, just had, we just had a couple, Guido. Um, is raw fleece before marketing a commodity store? What was that first word, Debbie? Raw fleece. Okay, so it would, so the raw fleece, so uh, I'm assuming it's coming off of a sheep. It's been shorn. It might be, sometimes they, they uh, also use the term, it might be a greasy fleece or a dirty fleece. Uh, that is that's going to be a farm commodity or a or a farm product. It's the wool. Sometimes uh, to try to get a better market price, the fleece is washed on the farm uh, and then is baled uh, along with uh, and then sold um, as a bale. I mean, and this would be large, uh, you know, like the the twenty thousand. Uh, you flock that I that I saw in New Zealand. I mean, that's you know they they're they're harvesting uh, the fleece off of that. But the fleece in the raw or in the greasy or in the dirty context, the, either washed or that's going to be an agricultural product. Okay. Uh, the other question was. Is renting out part of my land in order to an allow another farmer to harvest hay considered farming? Okay, farm rent, depending if it is a cash rent, so let, let's say $100 an acre just to keep the math easy, uh, that is going to be rental real estate activity. Even though you are renting farmland, it is a return from an, an investment that happens to be um, hay meadow. Uh, so that is not farming. If, however, you are renting the land on a crop share basis, 50-50, and you get 50% of the hay, then you're going to have a special form. It's of uh, IRS form 4835 which looks very similar to Schedule F, but it is crop share rental income. So you'll, whether it depends on what you do with, with your part of the hay, if, it, if it's done that way, uh, it could, and if you sell it, then it's gonna end up on uh, 4835. You could have expenses such as prorated expense for insurance or property taxes or repairs relative to that rented portion of the farm, that would be all deducted on 4835 to get you a net rent value. And for the purposes, for some of the income tax purposes, that is considered to be farming. But if you if the 
questioner, if the individual that asked the question is receiving cash rent, that is not farm income. That's rental income. And that gets reported on Schedule E as an echo, which is uh, part page one. And that's where we would report the rental income and deduct any rental expenses. Thank you, Guido. That's all the questions for this section. Okay, very good. All right. So let's move on. Oh, hang on. One more just came in. <laughs> okay, no problem. We're, we're doing well. We're, Last we're doing minute well. there. So if I sell homemade bread and other similar products at my farm produce stand, a value-added product, where is this income reported? That's going to be reported, should be reported on Schedule C because you've got uh, the a bread business. If if you're if you're baking the bread, you know if you raise the wheat and grind the wheat, you know the Chicken Little story, uh, and then bake the bread, uh, then not only are you a farmer raising the wheat, but you are also a baker baking the bread, and the bread is not is not in its original state. The wheat kernel would be in the original state. Uh, or the wheat berry, uh, as as it were, the bread is a value added, as as the questioner uh, correctly stated, and uh, that should be on a Schedule C. So there would be uh, potentially two different businesses. Okay, we have some late breaking questions. Um, are thank you. Are dried herbs or flowers for tea considered value added products? So these are just herbs that are picked and dried. Okay, so that that gets into a little bit of a gray area. My answer would be that they are not value added because the taxpayer's intent was to uh, produce the tea. Now, where I'm going to deviate slightly is if that tea is blended. So you've got mint. And you may have, uh, you know, some other, other uh, teas, leaves, or whatever, and you blend it, and you come up with a blended tea. That blended tea to a recipe most likely would qualify as value added. Now, upstairs in our kitchen right now, I've got three big bags of mint tea. Uh, my wife harvested the, the mint that we have in our garden, and then she's dried it, and then she has uh, prepared it, and it is now tea. And uh, when we want some mint tea, we don't go to the store. We go to Miss Emily's uh, cupboard, and uh, we, we get it there. Uh, that tea would have was just, uh, or that mint was just naturally dried in the sunshine, and then uh, uh, she just packaged it. So it it didn't hasn't changed anything except that it's dry and it is stable to be held long term. But if you're mixing two and and you got several different teas or several different herbs like rosemary and you might be putting rose hips in there or something of that nature uh, to to a recipe, uh, I think that 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 could blend over to value added because because of that recipe. Okay, thank you. Let's let's go ahead and move on. Okay, very thank good. You. Yep, yep. Okay, so this is going to be, uh, and we're going to see line by line, and and we'll have snippets here uh, of uh, or screenshots, I guess, is the the more appropriate term of these lines. So the first thing we'll see here on Schedule F is basically what I'm I'm referring to as the information block. And it's got the place for the name of the business owner or the proprietor. You can see that uh, on the scene. You've got the social security number. You also have whatever is the principal uh, crop or activity. You've got the activity code, all of those things. We find those in the instructions. What are the farm activity code? That's at the bottom of Schedule F. So when you print out both pages of Schedule F, we only for cash purposes will use page one. Uh, but on the second page at the bottom, the bottom third is full of a bunch of different types of uh, farm types, dairy, beef cattle, um, and you can plug those, plug those in. We also want to uh, 
tick the box. What kind of accounting method do you use? Well, for my presentation tonight, I'm assuming cash. So one would tick the little box to the left of the word cash. And then we have the employer ID number. Well, if one has employees, even if you're a sole proprietor, you will want to have both the sole proprietor social security number as well as the employer ID number because IRS is going to be matching information being sent forward to them. Did you withhold uh, payroll taxes? If so, you would have done it under the employee ID number and they want to make and tick that box and, and check that and make sure. Now, what if we're a single member LLC? And last week, several people said that they were single member LLCs. Well, for income tax purposes, that's treated as a disregarded entity. So we'll just go ahead and file Schedule F as if we were a sole proprietor. So you could put there, name of the proprietor would be, you know, Guido Vanderhoven. And then parenthetically, you could put the name of your LLC or vice versa. But you would want to have both the Social Security number as well as the federal ID number or the employer ID number for the LLC reported on Schedule F, just so that IRS can say, yep, this entity is reporting because they know that somebody formed an LLC. It just happens to have one member. And therefore, for simplification purposes, it's being treated as a disregarded entity, but they still want to know that it's being, being taken care of. The next question we look at item E is a material participation question, meaning did you do the work? Were you active and materially participating in this business? And the answer is yes, uh, it, in most of the case, because that means if you've got a loss, more than likely you're going to be able to use that loss against other ordinary income. As you see there, no. if the answer is no, then you have to look at the limitations for passive losses, because then it's going to think uh, uh, IRS is going to treat this as a passive activity, which you really don't want them to do. Uh, and we talked a little bit about passive income from rentals uh, last week. You might want to go and review those notes and, and some of that discussion when that uh, video gets posted. So we would tick yes. Then question F is, did you make any payments that would require uh, that 1099 be filed? So that's, did you pay an unincorporated business $600 or more for some service that they provided? Did the backhoe company come out, uh, the veterinarian, uh, whatever? If you did, you tick, tick yes. And then the next question is, if you ticked yes, did you or will you file the record required forms 1099 and hopefully everybody will say yes I did and I'll tick those okay so that's the information block now some folks say well why do I need to put anything in there on principal crop or activity under line or question a and then block b enter the code well USDA has some interest in some stuff they don't look at your tax return as does, IR, uh, as does IRS, as does the Department of Commerce. They're not looking at your tax. They don't get access to that. But what they can get is how many of these Schedule Fs are filed? How many of these types of farms are filing Schedule F? So there's some statistical analysis that's, that's uh, able to, to be gathered without letting anybody know specifically that Guido operates a farm uh, in that regard. But there is some statistical uh, survey and sampling that's done just from, you know, line A and line B. But it also helps IRS to kind of figure out what's going on and, and do they need to change some rules. Okay, so now we get to talk about some income. We figured out who we were. We figured out what kind of farm we're reporting for. And now we're going to start looking at some of these items as, as we go through. So the first one is, is line one. Line one has three different parts, as you can see here on the screen. 
They're used to report generally the sale and cost of items where the intent by the farmer was to purchase those, maybe raise them up, as in my first example we'll see here, and then subsequently we're going to resell those animals in the market. And so Rob here, he's purchased 50 feeder pigs. He paid $5,000 for those feeder pigs back in February. And then he raises, he's going to sell them when they reach market weight. And, you know, that's generally going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of four to five months down the road, uh, depending on how big those little piggies were and how the weather, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the thing is, did these little pigs, were they born on Rob's farm? And the answer to that is no. They were born on Debbie's farm. Debbie sold Rob these farm these pigs. And she she sold these little these little piglets. They were weighing 45 pounds. They were cute, pink little things, curly little tails. Uh, she sold them for five thousand dollars. Well, then Rob took them, brought them home, and he started feeding them and taking care of them and husbanding them. And he got them up to about 200, 225, 230 pounds. They were ready for the market, nice lean. Uh, meat animals and took them to the sale barn and he received 22,550 for them. And so you can see that, ah, 22,550 is what he sold. That was the sale of those livestock, those items. And then he had a basis, what he paid Debbie for those animals. So his gross margin is that 17,550 that you see reported there in line 1C. Now, the feed expense, and we'll get to that tomorrow uh, on Wednesday, the feed expense, the vet expense, all of those expenses, they're going to come down on part two of, of uh, Schedule F. Now, another example here that I've seen, and this is that Jill sells corn and soybean seed to her neighbors, but she also buys from this particular vendor, whether it be DeKalb or Pioneer or, or whomever, uh, and she does that so that she can reduce her personal seed input costs. Uh, and basically what she's got is that she's got $35,000 uh, of the seed. She pays Pioneer or DeKalb $28,000 for it. And so she basically gets a $7,000 margin, as you can see uh, there on line 1C. So two examples of where a farmer would purchase something with the intent to resell it at a markup or at a market gain, and then we're actually only going to pay tax on that net margin amount or that gross margin amount that we see on line 1C in both of these examples. So this gets us now to line two, and this is probably the place where most folks are going to be reporting income from farming activities. So this is where we have livestock, produce, grains that have been raised on the farm uh, and that are going to be sold. And then we end up with those values uh, being reported all together uh, from one of those. And you can see the line instructions, sales of livestock, produce, grains, and other products that you raised. Those other products could be honey. Those other products could be, as somebody was asking about fleece uh, for from uh, shorn lambs or shorn sheep, that's going to be there. It could be hides. Uh, if you're selling cow hides, uh, you know, along with, you may take that animal to market, you may have a uh, meat business well, what do you do with the hide? Well, you might be selling that to a tannery. And so that would also be a Schedule F uh, type of business. So let's let's look at some of these examples and kind of kind of go through these. I think they'll they'll make sense. So here, our first individual is a mall. She raises figs and dates on her farm as a single member LLC. She happens to be in California. I've just mixed it around a little bit. She sells her annual production under contract to a cooperative. Uh, this year, her total production generated $50,000, and Amal reports this income as a total value. The $50,000 would go on line two. 
Now we got Jerome and Betty, they farm as a partnership. So it could be this uh, brother and sister, could be husband and wife. But the thing is, they are a partnership in the story here. Uh, they grow wheat and grain sorghum or milo, as they also have a 300 head commercial cow herd and they sell light feeder cattle in the late autumn. So you've got Jerome and Betty's gross through their partnership. You've got, they sold $150,000 of wheat, $250,000 worth of grain sorghum, $200,000 of the market calves. And so they're going to, the partnership is going to use line two of Schedule F to report its total raised farm production sales. And this, and if I've done my math right, it's uh, $600,000 there. Schedule F is in this case going to be a supporting document to IRS Form 1065. But the partnership is the farmer. Jerome and Betty actually do the work, uh, the farming work, but uh, and would also be considered farmers. But for income tax purposes, they are the partnership is the is the farmer, and then and they move through. The third example there is Ronaldo. This is maybe one a little bit more in line with uh, North Carolina. Uh, Ronaldo Inc. harvests and bales pine straw for landscaping companies. The corporation rents several acres of longleaf pine forest from local landowners, and the pine straw is an annual crop generated by these trees. And because it's an annual crop, it's not a timber crop. And this year they sold $60,000 of pine straw bales, and that's going to be reported or could be reported on line two of Schedule F because it makes sense there. And again, Schedule F is going to be a supporting document, a supporting form. In this case, again, it's an 1120S, so it's a sub S corporation, closely held, small family corporation that folks uh, would be using. Now, just a couple of things, uh, just as, as a caution regarding line two. And in 40 years, I've seen this error over and over and over again. A matter of fact, I had an email exchange last week with somebody who said, I was doing it this way, and I had to explain to them that it was probably a little bit different. So that is that raised breeding dairy or draft animals. Now, these are the adults. They could be breeding sheep. They could be breeding cow, uh, beef cattle. They could be dairy cows, dairy sheep, dairy goats, uh, or draft animals. And I'm, th I'm thinking of uh, you know draft horses, but you could also have bullocks, uh, depending on where, where they are. And, and some folks do use those type of draft animals even today in 2024. But if those animals were born and raised on the farm and then utilized as either a breeding animal as an adult or as a dairy animal or as a draft animal as an adult, then it is incorrect when they are sold to report them on Schedule F because they are actually part of the factory for the market product. Let's look at this particular example here. Jose operates a, a dairy, again, as a single member LLC and reports his income and expenses on Schedule F. Now his milking herd averages about 20, uh, 100 cows. He, ha he has on average at any one time, 60 baby to springing heifers and he's replacing anywhere from 20 to 25 milk cows per year. So he's turning his milking string about once every four to five years uh, from his replacement herd. Now, if his long-term average was $750 per cold dairy cow, and right now they're probably getting more for that, but just for the example's sake, Jose in this case is generating anywhere from 15,000 to 18,750 in cull cow sales. Now, the animals, even though they're raised on Jose's farm, they're not reported on Schedule F, but they are reported on Part 1 
of the IRS Form 4797, which is the sale of business assets. Because the purpose of these dairy cows of Jose's was to produce milk. Milk was the farm product in this case. And that milk sale would go to line two. Now, if he sold calves, you know, the bull calves would go to that. That's going to go on line two. But if he's raised these cows to be part of this milking string, part of the factory that produces the milk, if you will, if you think about it in the industrial context, then those animals are business property and they are properly reported on part one of 4797. And they get actually preferential capital gains treatment by being reported there. If you report it on line two of Schedule F, then you end up paying tax at ordinary income rates, plus you're going to pay self-employment tax on it at another 15.3%. So having the records detail this differential is very, very important. Whether you're raising sheep, whether you're raising goats, whether you're raising hogs, whatever, if they are for breeding purposes or for dairy purposes, they are part of the factory if you want to think about it in that context. And it's really important to get that right. And just to, to illustrate, uh, about 30 years now, 30 or so years ago, I picked up a client, looked at, the re at their returns. I asked for three years of returns. And they had uh, a sow herd, a, a nine, uh, 900 head sow herd, and they had a 300 head cow herd. I could not find any cull breeding animals. I discovered that they were reported on Schedule F. I amended three years of returns, the open years, and got him back the money that he had overpaid. And when I did so, I said, I've just paid for my services for the next 20 years. So it is important to understand. And that's why we talked about the character of income last week. And we spent quite a bit of time on that. Caution number two is, is thinking, and this does apply somewhat to North Carolina because we do have quite a bit of integrated production. I don't know how much uh, of the folks online participate in that, but just to be fair and complete in the conversation, even though in this case, farmers raise an animal product, the reporting of that income may not be found on line two. And what I'm showing here is in the case of raising pigs or poultry as part of an integrated production system, that income should be reported on Schedule F line eight, which is other income. And the example that I'm using here is that we've got Alan operating a ferro to wean operation for a national integrator. Alan owns the farrowing barns. He provides the labor, the utilities, and the repairs to his buildings and to the, to the equipment that's in there. But the integrator owns the sows and the piglets, which the sows bear and birth. Uh, the integrator also provides feed and veterinary supplies. Alan is paid on a piglet delivered basis with possibilities for premiums based on the feed conversion of all of the, the, the animals under his care, as well as a live number of live animals that uh, were birthed and delivered. And at the end of the day, he is going to receive a 1099 NEC because this is a custom service business. And in this case, I'm using $425,000 because he does not own the sows or the piglets. And line eight made accounting easy for when we had something called the DPAD, the Domestic Production Activities Deduction, and that was available prior to 2018. We now have uh, something called the uh, uh, Qualified Business Income Deduction. It's a little different with things. And, uh, uh, but it's important, again, to be very consistent and knowledgeable in, in our record keeping.
So that covered uh, basically line one and line two. I'm wondering, Debbie, are there any questions? We we <laughs> we do have some questions. Um, and um, I'm noticing people are sending me private questions. So if anybody is a little shy about publicly writing your question in the chat, feel free to send it to me privately. Um, okay, we're just going to run through these. If I'm, and I'm going to, Guido, just to give you a, time check at seven o'clock so yep yeah and um, we're we're ha we're about halfway through okay well we're, we got a lot of questions here if i'm a sole proprietor dba do i need to file to get an ein or can i enter social security number indefinitely you use your social security number <laughs> as a sole proprietor when you if you start hiring help having employees then you'll need to get a federal id number Thank you. I operate an LLC. I have an investor who holds 10% of my business as stated in our operating agreement. I was told by the North Carolina Secretary of State that I was not required to register as an LLC partnership. How do I handle this in my taxes? The investor is an LLC company held by a retirement account. Whose retirement account? If uh, if it's your re if it's the individual's retirement, this is a pretty complicated question because <clears throat> it, it it really gets down in there. I <clears throat> on the surface, I would answer it's a partnership because you've got two members. You have the retirement account, and and then you've got the uh, the individual that owns ninety percent. I hesitate to say that because it because the Secretary of State's office says you don't have to, which leads me to think it might be the sole proprietor's retirement account, so it's a related entity. But that actually is getting into a little bit of a legal question. Uh, but I would defer to uh, the Secretary of State, but sometimes they can be wrong too. Okay. Line F is required for vet bills or contractors that I paid more than $600 when I had a concrete company pour for a pin, I don't understand this. When I had a concrete company pour for a pin, I put them under expenses. Did I do that wrong? Well, line F is just answering the question. You would report the, the expenses under supplies or repairs. The issue is, is did you pay that concrete company $600 or more? And was that concrete company an unincorporated business. If they were an unincorporated business, then they would have needed to have a 1099 uh, NEC issued to them for that amount. Thank you. When you're talking about line one, with the example you gave of Rob and the pigs, does Rob need to file a 1099 for the purchase of the pigs? No, you do not need to file any 1099 for commodities purchased. Okay. If a, if a farmer buys a larger amount of something than he needs and sells the unused portion for what it costs him, so zero profit, does it need to be reported in line one? You would want to do that because if the return was ever audited, you could show that I... I sold it for 20,000, I paid 20,000, I had zero gain because they're gonna see a $20,000 deposit when they review your checking account versus your tax return. So it's always good to report that. Okay. Do old layers that are sold as soup chickens say, go on 4797? I think those actually go on Schedule F because generally the layer has a 1 to 18, maybe a 24-month lifespan. Okay. I've got one more question, but before I ask it, ask it, excuse me, I'm going to ask last call for questions in this section so y'all can be putting them in so he doesn't start when the questions start coming in again. Okay, now we're talking about honey okay. or bees. Anyway, beekeeping. When selling honeybee co colonies, produ 
uh, produce honey uh, or nukes too small to produce honey yet. I'm sorry, produce. Produce honey or nukes too small to produce honey yet. Are the sales reported on line two or considered business assets? Those would be uh, sold on line two because I'm assuming that those bees were gathered and grew on the farm. Uh, and so I would I would be more comfortable putting, putting them on uh, line two. And I think that there is a treasury regulation that supports that. Okay. My county indicated that I could allow a farmer to harvest my land for hay and that I could obtain farm deferment for my land by obtaining the farmer's cattle sale receipts. Could you explain this? Okay. What line would I report this income? All right. So basically what the county is saying is in order to qualify for PUV, present use value, then that property has to generate a thou at least $1,000 worth of income over a consistent period of time. If you rent the land and your tenant raises cattle on it or raises hay on it, for which the value of that hay or the value of those market calves would be in excess $1,000 or more over the requisite period of time. You have met the income generation, but it's not your income, it's the tenant's income. You just have to prove that income was produced on that property, whether it was yours or the tenant's. So you would not be reporting the tenant's income for tax purposes but you would report the in for income tax purposes, but you would have a requirement to prove up for property tax purposes that the property qualifies for the income uh, requirement. For present use value, right. For present, for present use value, yes. Right, thank you. Um, have you addressed equestrian activities like boarding or pasture boarding? What about equestrian anti-discrimination bill that might be out of your realm? <laughs> well, board, boarding and, and pasturing, of, that's a farming activity. I that's, meant the anti-discrimination. I didn't know if that I, was something. No, I haven't. I'm not sure what the anti-discrimination bill, what, 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 what that is. I need to educate myself. But um, yeah, so anything else? I mean, I'm not sure what the question was about boarding or pasture boarding. Yeah. I have no I, idea. Yeah, you have uh, you have addressed that, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, that's in that definition. Right. For training of animals, et cetera, et cetera. Any final questions before Guido moves on? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. Um. If a, veterinary, if a veterinarian practice has more than one veterinarian, do I 1099 each, I love that when it's a verb, do I 1099 each veterinarian I use or just 1099 the practice? You, For clarity, you, what I pay my veterinarian includes all supplies, medications, and salaries, including for others such, vet tech, such as vet techs and surgeons. Yeah. Yeah. Um. More than likely, the invoice for the services was issued to you by the vet clinic, regardless of who performed them. If you paid over $600 for those services, for the services, even though there might be some incidental uh, medical uh, medications, et cetera, uh, you're going to issue a 1099 to the vet clinic. And that vet, and it's going to be for health services because veterinary is is a health service and you would also do that even if the vet clinic is incorporated so my guess is that you're going to issue if you paid over six hundred dollars issue a 1099 miscellaneous for health services to the vet clinic regardless if it's incorporated or not Okay, I don't see any more questions. Just going to hold here for a second or two. 
See if anything else rolls in. We've got, we have two more pauses. Yeah, we got, okay. I think we're good to roll on, Guido. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, uh, I'm as I said, I'm going through these uh, line by line. Some of these lines may be uh, pertinent to those individuals that are on the call or not, uh, but some of them may not be. So the next one is lines 3A and 3B. This is where we have patronage dividends. And so farmers may participate and be members of a cooperative. It could be a, a, a marketing cooperative, like a lot of dairy farmers are. They, they sell their milk through a co-op or it could be a supply co-op like Southern States is. Uh, and if the co-op is profitable, they, they, the co-op may issue a dividend, part of those profits back to its members. And those dividends are gonna be part of farm income. Where we're gonna be interested in those is gonna be on boxes one, two, three, five, and six. They are particularly important. And these values then represent the pass-through of the co-op's income to the member, and that is going to be based on their business that they have done uh, as a as a percentage of the gross business that the cooperative did in the year. So box number one, as you can see, there's the patronage dividend. Box number two is non-patronage distributions. It's a rare case, but sometimes there's a distribution that's non-patronage, so it has nothing to do with the business. They just were, they they may have had some stocks and bonds that they they invested some, and then they got gains on those, and they came back through to you. Uh, if you sell items through the cooperative, it could be that you're selling milk or you're selling grain sales. It could be that the co-op is retaining a, a, a little bit on a per unit basis, and that would be represented in box three. Um, box four is, did, did the taxpayer elect to have any income tax withheld? Generally, uh, that answer is no. Uh, we have redeemed non-qualified notices. It could be there. And then there's also the 199 cap A deduction. That's the pass through uh, uh, business income deduction uh, that originated in the cooperative, and then it goes through. Uh, there are other items there that might partic uh, be specific to the cooperative and then are being passed through to the individual member or patron of the co-op. But typically, in my experience, I'm looking for numbers that are on, in boxes one, two, and three, uh, sometimes I'm going to look at what's there in box six. Uh, but if you use some software uh, and you uh, get down to this particular line in the, in the program, it'll say, do you have numbers? Or you'll get a little screen that'll say, put the numbers that, are rep that, are, that you see in the boxes, and then the software takes care of it and files the other, uh, any forms that are there. But when you get that, get a patronage dividend, it's going to be uh, listed there generally on box box one. Here, I've just got a couple of examples to, to show how, how this might be. You got Ralph operating a dairy because uh, I know that there, uh, well, there aren't as many dairies in North Carolina as there used to be. Um, but he sells milk to a cooperative. This year, the cooperative reports his patronage of 1,000. 300 of which is in cash and 700 is retained earnings for the co-op to use in operations. But he's going to get box one of $1,000. He's going to pay tax on the full thousand, even though he only got $300 in cash. And that's done so that he would have sufficient cash to pay tax on the full cooperative dividend. Additionally, there's some per unit retained allocations of 5,000. So the total taxable amount is going to be six thousand dollars. However, he only received three hundred dollars in cash, and he reports the full six thousand on uh, his Schedule F uh, using lines three A and three B, as you see illustrated there. Now, sometimes, depending on the cooperative, they will hold these capital retained earnings for a certain period of time—twenty years, twenty-five years. 
once those co-op those retained earnings have reached that threshold of 20 or 25 years they get paid back and it is really important because you might get uh, an individual might get two checks or 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 two pieces of correspondence one is with the patronage dividend the other is with a already taxed amount of money in my example here $5500 where the revenue is not going to be taxed in the current year because it was taxed 20 years ago. And the rec and Ralph's records should reflect the non-taxable nature of this particular payment. And now, typically, there's going to be some kind of notation that the payment is not taxable. It could be a phrasing like, this was previously taxed income. We're returning to you part of the capital retained in the past, yada, 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 yada. Uh, I belong to an uh, electric cooperative in Kansas 30 years ago, and after 20 years, I started getting some of the capital retained uh, monies back, and now I've been completely paid back uh, from, from my, my time uh, there. The next one is line 4A and 4B. These are government payments. So depending on what programs are available, what uh, these farmers and ranchers, they could receive various payments from USDA or even from state agencies. And North Carolina's uh, Department of uh, Agriculture and Con Consumer Services has been pretty good in some years uh, when they had some excess funds to help fund some environmental stuff and, and provide grants. So these payments are reported on lines 4A and 4B. And here is just an example of a 1099G. Uh, one, and, you, and you use these for all sorts of different reasons that and funding. You would see the box one is unemployment compensation. Well, by definition, farmers are never un, unemployed. They're always working. But for the purposes of tonight's conversation, for tonight's discussion, we're going to focus on boxes six, seven, and nine. Six is taxable grants. So I had a question that came in. It says, if I got, if I got a, a grant from the state for a wind tunnel uh, improvement, is that taxable? Yes. You more than likely would have gotten a 1099G with the taxable grant from the state agency, and it would have been there in the payer's box. It would have been maybe the you know, North Carolina Department of, Consumer, of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Uh, but it would be there on box six. Uh, but when you did that tunnel improvement, so you report the income on the one side, and then you're going to take the deduction for the tunnel improvement. Let's say it's a, a dollar for dollar offset. It becomes a wash. You didn't have to pay for it out of your own pocket. So you got you were economically bettered, but you're paying, you're going to make that grant subject to tax. Then box seven is typically going to be the agricultural payments. These are going to be coming from USDA FSA office. Typically, you could have you know various different programs uh, that that come in, and there could be some market gain. Uh, and more than likely, the folks that are on the call tonight won't be looking at that. They may not be going under loan, but. If it does get, and I'll explain uh, looking at uh, CCC loans and, and what elections we have in just a few minutes, uh, we'll have that. But that would get reported there in box nine uh, as well. So just to reiterate, uh, government payments are going to be reported on a 1099G as in golf. Uh, and uh, boxes six, seven, and nine are going to be the ones that are going to be the ones that one would want to look at uh, most commonly relative to production agriculture. And here's just some examples. So Louisa grows many types of vegetables, and she markets to local and regional restaurants and grocery chains. Now, in the current year, She's received an ad hoc government payment of $15,000 under the ERP 2022 program. Now, this is for disaster uh, that happened in 2022. Uh, it could be heat. There were some monies that were set aside under uh, the IRA Act of uh, 2022 to fund ERP, and that's the Emergency Relief Program. That's what that stands for. 
So her 1099G, this is an ad hoc payment. It just comes once. Uh, it's going to show $15,000. She's received an attachment explaining the nature of the program, and she's going to report this on her uh, Schedule F, line 4A, as you can see illustrated, as well as the taxable amount over on 4, uh, 4B. Now, Veggie LLC, uh, again, just another entity example, farms vegetables and cut flowers on its 30-acre uh, 30 farm. Veggie received $2,000 in risk coverage payments. There were $10,000 in cost share payments for some conservation project on the farm. And there was also an additional $5,000 in conservation reserve payments, which were payments to divert highly erodible land into permanent cover crops. Um, so we got a total of $17,000. Veggies, because remember in this case, Veggie LLC is the farmer. So mm -hmm. Veggie LLC is going to get the agricultural payment through a 1099G. Box seven is going to show 17,000. All of that is going to be subject to tax in the current year and reported on line F of uh, uh, Schedule F, sorry, on line A, 4A and 4B. Now, just as a note, if Veggie is a single member LLC, the reporting is done in the name of the owner, as we've already talked about, and it's going to flow from Schedule F to then Form 1040, uh, the individual tax return. If Veg Veggie is an LLC with two or more members, then it's going to be taxed as a partnership, and it's going to report its farm income on IRS Form 1065, which is the partnership return. So here we go to, to and this, this little bit here, some folks may need to just bear with me a little bit, but just to get through it, because I don't know uh, your everybody's businesses there, obviously. Uh, but lines 5A, B, and C, this is where we look at uh, <clears throat> CCC loans. So when we look at the general principles of accounting, loan proceeds are not going to be treated as taxable income. But farmers and ranchers have the opportunity to make an election under Code Section 77 to treat CCC loans as income if it makes tax sense for them to do so. And this election, and subsequently, it could be revoked and it can be done repeatedly, backwards and forwards. And it just is another tool in the toolbox for farmers to manage farm income. And this is one of those things where farmers have some really preferential treatment of how they might treat to their benefit some of the revenue streams. And this particularly is CCC loans. And I give you the citation there. It's the Reverend... Revenue Procedure 2011-14. Now here, in this particular case, we got George and his taxpayer decide that for the current year, making the election to treat his $100,000 CCC loan as income is a great option because it helps George establish and meet his long-term business goals. So he would have the loan, he would make the election under Code Section 77, and all you need to do is there. Just report it, $100,000, just like you see on line 5A is illustrated at the bottom of this slide. Now, lines 5A, B, and C, we're going to continue this. Now, George, in the previous example, now he repays this loan in March. And since he took out the CCC loan, the commodity price increased so that when George sold, he received $200,000. Now, remember, he took the, out the loan, but he still held physically the corn. He didn't sell it, but he treated it as if he sold it. So the commodity price increased so that when George sold, he received $200,000. But because he had made the election to treat the $100,000 as income, he now has basis or cost in that commodity. And now he's going to report this as if it had been purchased for resale item, which is essentially what he did. He paid the loan off, $100,000, sold it for $200,000. But remember, last year we reported $100,000 worth of income. You don't want to pay that, uh, that twice. 
And so you see that line 1C for the current year is $100,000. And this is really needing to have a clear communication between the preparer and the farmer if this happens to be the case. Probably not applicable to many of the folks on the, on the but just show you how that works. Now, what happens if we treat CCC loans as loans? Well, here we wouldn't tax it. She received this loan as $150,000. She had anticipated that the price of corn would increase, kind of like what George did in the previous one, but that did not happen. And the local corn price was under the per bushel loan value. So in this case, it makes sense to forfeit the loan and then release the corn to CCC for payment. And that's when she's going to, to report it as on B, loans forfeited $150,000 and then moves it over taxable $150,000. So that's, again, needs clear communication, what's going on uh, on the thing. And oftentimes this type of transaction is going to occur over two different tax years. So again, there needs to be good records as to what's going on. And if we, we see this, and this is the last one of this, is if we repaying the CCC loan at the posted county price, otherwise known as the PCP, Crops Inc. goes under CCC loan for 150,000, but does not make the election to treat the loan as income, so it's a loan. When the posted county price was 325, it repays the loan to the CCC with $135,000, then turns around and sells the corn for $145,000. Crops Inc. is going to get this CCC 1099G for $15,000. Remember, they borrowed 150, paid back with 135. He's going to have to pay tax on that difference, which is the 15,000, but he sold the corn in total, total economic value is going to be $160,000. The 145 that he sold the corn for plus 15,000, the market gain. And this is how we would report that market gain. So as I promised, uh, another opportunity for any questions. Okay, thank you, Guido. Um, how do I issue a 1099 non-employee compensation form? Can I find a website? I can actually send that out with a follow-up email, but anything yeah, that, you want to say about that? Yeah, that, I mean, you can just Google 1099 NEC and it'll take you to the uh, the federal, uh, the IRS website and you can download some of those. The, things are, the thing is with a 1099, you cannot handwrite them. They're supposed to be machine written. So either a typewriter for those of us that remember what a typewriter is, uh, or you can set it up on a printer. You can go to Office Depot or Office Max or Staples. Uh, they also this time of year will have uh, the forms that are available and uh, a little bit of software to issue those. So uh, there, there are places around to, to, to get the physical forms and then uh, the instructions, you can look for the instructions on, because you will issue a copy to the individual that you paid, and then you will also issue a copy to IRS. Um, and so that's you reporting to them that you did file the 1099. They now have the information and they can match it back to the person that you paid to make sure that they report that income and pay tax on it. And one of the one of the resources I send out in the follow-up email after the webinar is some commonly used forms, and I'm pretty sure it's already on there. Yeah. Okay, next question. I received NRCS cost share grants and reported the income on line four, but I put all the expenses for high tunnel seeds and mulch on part two. Does that mean I did this wrong and it wasn't a wash and I paid taxes on that grant? Well, if you put it on 4A and you did not put it on 4B, uh, then my guess is you got uh, you deducted the expense, but you did not include the income to offset. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This um, this from a, from a beekeeper. 
how are losses reported? For example, livestock or honeybee colonies that die. If they are raised and you <laughs> and you you collected those and and the or you've purchased them, um, then you will report the loss. Uh, if, if they're raised, you you're deducting their law uh, their expenses on your schedule f over time and and you would and their basis is zero so even though you have an economic loss you don't have a tax loss if you purchased bees and we had a freeze and they froze and died then you would want to report that on 4797 part two where you would have a sale price of zero, and then the basis would be, let's say $500, and then you would have a loss of $500, which will then transfer from part two of 4797 to schedule one of 1040 as a loss, and then be deducted against other income sources. Okay. Single member LLC is the member contribution and income. I think there you're the individual is referring to uh, a capital contribution to the LLC. That should go to the capital account. It is not income of the LLC. It is what is referred to as outside basis of the member and that outside basis can go up or down over the course of time as the LLC uh, generates income, basis could go up. Um, if it generates a loss, then basis could go down. But you do want to make sure that you keep track of that capital account going up and down. It's not going to be income per se, but you want to make sure that if you quit farming and shut the LLC down and you have a $10,000 investment, you, you've lent money, if you want to think about it in that context, to the LLC to get started, then you have a capital loss of $10,000 that you want to be able to, because the company didn't, the company didn't pay you back. Um, the single member LLC rules are a little nuanced as opposed to partnership rules relative to that, but you've made an investment in a business. The business consumed that income. You never deducted the loss of that income uh, because you were, you were operating the company and you were you know, reporting profits and losses over time. But now you've got, you've got this, this, hey, I lent this money to this to the company, to the LLC, and it never paid me back. Uh, what do I do with it? And so, uh, you know, and, and the reason I say that for single member LLCs, it's nuanced. Remember, the single member LLC is a disregarded entity for tax purposes. And you do, what you want to do is you want to make sure that this is treated as a business loss not a personal loss, okay? Uh, without getting into uh, too deep a thing, business losses would be deductible. Personal losses are not going to be deductible. Okay. A farmer should issue a 1099 NEC, should issue to any service provided over $600 of worth, or are there only specific types of services that this pertains to? For example, as a flower farmer, I had a large permanent deer fence installed. Do I need to issue the fence company a 1099 NEC? Uh, yes, you would, assuming that the fence company is not incorporated. If the fence company is incorporated, then you don't need to. Then the the fence that they that they built for you, that would be an an agricultural fence and would be a depreciated item. Okay. 
next question. Um, keep it, let go ahead and put more questions in if y'all have them because this is the last question so far. As the owner of the LLC, who takes owner draws? Do I issue myself a ten ninety nine? No. Okay. <laughs> you, if you're a single member LLC, you're disregarded. You're just taking a draw. And at the end of the year, you need to make sure that your draws did not uh, exceed your income. Because if it did, then then what, what happens is that's reduced your basis in that LLC. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions? Because he's got more content. Here we go. If, if the farmer who also has personal income from an off-farm job loans his farm money, but the farm cannot pay him back, what can he do? If the farm is a sole proprietor, uh, then you just want to keep track of that. That, uh, that does, because... If that becomes a capital loss, then you'll be able to deduct it against capital income or up to $3,000 uh, using the capital loss rules. So again, you need to have <clears throat> uh, clear records of, of when this money was lent to the company. Is the company a sole proprietorship? Is the company an LLC? Is the company a corporation? Is the company a partnership? All of those things play into how fast and and when one could take it. But more than likely, that's going to be a capital loss and it'll be subject to the capital loss rules, no more than $3,000 of loss per tax year. Okay. If a service, if a service, a company is an LLC, is that considered an incorporated business and would not need a 1099? If that service LLC made the election to be taxed as a corporation, then the answer is yes. Uh, they don't need to have a 1099. But the question is, what did the invoice say? Did the invoice say it was uh, provide you some information that they were taxed as a corporation or not? If you don't know, you need to call them and say, how are you guys being taxed? Okay. Um Guido, I mean, that's the last question so far. It's 7.35. How are we doing um, on time? Uh, we need to keep going and okay, then let's we'll keep have some going. time at the end. Okay, let's keep going then. Thank you. Yep. So lines 6A, B, C, and D, this is for our crop insurance and federal disaster payments. And so this is, again, may not be applicable to many of the folks that are on, but there are uh, some new insurance products that are being tested uh, by USDA uh, to come out and help with some of these specialty crops. But crop and fed insurance and federal disaster payments, they're going to be treated as farm income, and they're going to be treated and reported on line six. Uh, generally, under the constructive receipt rules, crop insurance and disaster payments are going to be recognized in the year of receipt. However, such payments can be deferred if the farmer's or rancher's business practice was to sell 50% or more of their crop production in the year following when that crop was produced. So it's very clear, important to understand the business model of the farm. And so the best way I can do this is looking at this through examples. So here we've got our good buddy, Roberto. He raises wheat, corn, soybeans. In 2023, a hailstorm ruins the wheat crop and he has a 75% reduction in yield. Typically, he sells his wheat a few months after harvest. He receives a crop insurance check for 50,000 bucks. He gets a 1099 miscellaneous from the crop insurance company with box nine showing 50,000, and he's gonna report the crop insurance as I'm illustrating below uh, here. He'll put 50,000 in uh, 6A and also in 6B, for the 2023 year. If, however, his business practice was to sell the wheat crop in the year after it was produced, he can make the election to defer that until the following year. And what the reason for that is, is so that he doesn't have two wheat crops in one year and can kind of keep his income level. 
So he would report his income on line 6A because IRS has got a, a 1099 miscellaneous for $50,000, but he's going to make the election by ticking the box in 6C to defer it to 2024. But you don't have anything over there on 6B or 6D. But for matching purposes, IRS knows that he reported the 50,000, but he made an election. In this case here, we've got Amanda raising Milo alfalfa and soybeans. Her uh, crops were flooded out. She got $200,000 in crop insurance, and she also had $150,000 in disaster relief, relief because she was in a federally, federally declared disaster area. And her longtime business practice was then to sell Milo and soybeans in the following year. And so now when you look at the story, what we're doing is we're looking at the 2023. So her 2021 crop carried into 22, the insurance and the disaster payments, they came in the fall of 22. She didn't want to have two crops reported. So she elected in 22 to defer into 23. And now what she's doing in 23 is she's reporting that amount that was deferred in 22 into 23. And she does that on line 6D, as you can see illustrated there. If you just pay it, just look at that. It does make a measure of sense, but we've got <clears throat> different, different years there. We've got actually three different years, 21, 22, and 23, but you got to think about what she's doing. And again, I don't know how many people on the call would benefit from this, but this is an option that's available to them. Now, we've had several questions over, over the, the course of the evening, uh, but here we come to the custom hire. So oftentimes, farmers are going to help their neighbors. You know, something goes down, uh, and this is going to be custom work or machine hire that's reported on line 7 of Schedule F as income. So here we've got Ted. He bails hay for his elderly uh, neighbor, Tom. Tom pays Ted for his work, machine time, and fuel. And this year, that amount is $1,200. So Tom's going to issue to Ted a Form 1099-NEC. And Ted is going to report that income on line 7 of Schedule F, as I'm illustrating here. This may be a one-off. This may be very infrequent. This could be maybe less than 2% of the total Schedule F income that Ted has. So it's appropriate. It doesn't rise to the level of a separate service business. And so we would have our $1,200 that's reported here on line seven. Now, you've got a couple of other things here. You've got Georgia. She contracts with the township in which she lives. Uh, to mow ditches, and she uses her equipment. The township pays her $2,000 per mowing. She's done it four times, so she generated $8,000. The township, in this case, is going to issue her a 1099 NEC for the machine hire. She also farms vegetables, and she sells that, but just like Ted, in the previous example, Georgia is going to use line seven of her Schedule F to report her custom hire income, okay? Now, here's where we end up with some questions, and this is going to get to some of the questions that were asked um, that, that I responded to. Now, here we've got Jose. He manages and operates a poultry farm. He also has a pair of backhoes and trailers, and he digs custom foundations for local contractors. And this year, Jose generated $200,000 of custom work digging foundations, and he generated $50,000 of income from his poultry business. So what does this look like? Well, the comment is, it may, just from these two numbers, it may look like that he farms part-time and he has a backhoe business. And so it may be more appropriate that Jose may want to organize the backhoe business for liability purposes in an LLC or corporation file a Schedule C or uh, an 1120 uh, for the corporation if he chose to do that. And then he just is going to be reporting his $50,000. Now, 
my rule of thumb when I worked with folks and looking at and experimenting with other options and other ways to utilize the resources that they had at hand, be it agritourism, be it value added. If I look, started looking at seeing what was on the tax return and this income was five to 10% of what gross farm income was, then it starts to ask, I start having the conversation and maybe it takes a few years to look at that and say, where do you think this is going? Where do you think your jam and jellies is going? Where do you think your wool yarn is going? And if it grows to like 20 or 25% and you think that that's, you're getting a name, you're getting established, you're using, utilizing more and more of your own production, you might be buying some stuff from other farms to get that and grow that business, then I think it's time to spin it off and have a Schedule C business. And now you've got your Schedule F, which is your true farm. And then you've got your Schedule C, which is your business. Uh, and, and really, when you look at it, the meat business, I mean, if you're dealing, if you're dealing with meat, uh, anything of foodstuffs, from a liability perspective, I've talked to enough folks, they have made the decision, I'm going to set that up as an LLC. You don't want anybody to get really sick through food poisoning and come back and uh, come back on you. So you want, you want to think about that. But just looking at this particular example, just kind of showing the differences between those two, you know, $200,000 of custom work and $50,000 worth of poultry. My gut reaction is he farms part-time. He's got a backhoe business. So now we get to line eight and we're starting to wrap this down a little bit. This is the catch-all. So this is where we've got other types of income that we don't have anywhere else to go with. So it's like bartering income, could be state gasoline or fuel tax refunds received, federal fuel tax credit claimed on the prior year, breeding fees or occasional fees for renting draft teams or farm machinery. You know, farmers do all sorts of different things Line eight is kind of catching it. Here we've got this one, uh, just showing you how the federal fuel credit comes. You got Bill farms part time, grows row crops and veggies. He's got two gasoline powered tractors he inherited from his granddad. He keeps records, and he's bought 500 gallons of gas that he's burned through the tractors. There's an 18.4 cent per gallon. Uh, federal excise tax that he claims for the non-highway gas. That's going to be $92. So on the 2023 return, he's going to get the credit of $92. And then next year in 2024, he's going to report the $92 as other income because he, he was able to, you got to think about it this way. He deducted the gasoline now he's getting a credit on gasoline that he deducted. IRS doesn't like folks getting a double goodie unless Congress lets them do that, and they have upon occasion. Uh, and then this way, he's going to have that other income and all everything is copacetic. And so in 2024, he's going to report the $92 of the credit that he generated on the 2023 return. So now we look at gross income from farming. We're wrapping this up. So we've gone through who you are. In this case, this is uh, Jorge, who has, uh, he farmed in corn, soybeans, and hogs. And there's the code for that. You just, we talked about that this uh, at the very beginning. And the code for this particular farm is 111100. And he's cash. But what we're looking at is we want to know what is the total gross income for this farm. And what we're going to do is we are going to uh, add one C all the way and through one uh, through eight, as you can see listed there. And in this particular case, that's going to be three hundred twenty-nine thousand two hundred bucks, just as the illustration. And there are a couple of things that I'll point to that we need to think about. One is is two thirds of his gross income that's reported on his return is it coming from farming? And we're going to look straight to line nine. That's gross income from farming, 329000 If two-thirds or more of that is, then he's going to be deemed to be a farmer for estimated 
tax purposes. And he can file his tax return by March 1 and not have to make any estimated tax payments. But if it's not, then he should make estimated tax payments and then he can pay his tax due on April 15th. The other thing we want to look at, and we'll see again on Wednesday how this will play out, is conservation expenses under code section 175 are limited to 25% of whatever is on line nine. And then in this case, uh, we've got $82,300. Uh, that's 25% of 329,200 bucks. So that number is very important. We have other calculations that we might need. And if some folks might be getting some crop share or cost share for some soil conservation work, you're going to report that over on line 4A and 4B, but you imp implement that, you may end up getting limited uh, and you may have to take that deduction over a period of, period of years. So um, that's, you need to be aware of what happens on line nine relative to soil and water conservation. So Debbie, we've got about 12, well, 11 minutes left. So this wraps it up. We've got a little bit of time. And if there aren't any questions, I do um, might want to hit a couple of these just to discuss. But you're going to send out this document to everybody tomorrow. Uh, so I, I don't want to steal from if somebody's got a pertinent question. Yes, thank you, Gita. We do have a few. Um, my, my husband has an LLC carpentry business. He doesn't charge me for labor, but rather acts as a purchasing agent and sends me an invoice at the end of the month for all the receipts he's added up for my farm projects. Do I need to file a 1099 NEC for that LLC as his invoices of receipts are over $600? Yes. Okay. That was easy. Quick. Um, question number one. Did you say you can retroactively up to three years back fix past tax returns. For example, I only learned after filing last year, 2022, that income averaging for farmers and fishermen Schedule J existed, which would have saved me on, on income tax. Can my CPA go back and reclaim overpayment of income taxes for years 2020 through 2022? Would that be done in conjunction with my 2023 taxes? Okay. So the answer to the question is yes, you can go back and amend. You can amend the three open years. Now, as we are stand tonight on the 19th of February, the open years are 22, 21, and 2020. On April 15th, when the filing season closes, the open years are going to be 2023, 2022, and 2021. The question is, how busy is your CPA? I would say go back, have that conversation, and if it makes sense to amend the 2020 return, do it before it closes on April 15th, 2024. You can always go back and amend, amend the 21 and the 22 after April 15th because those would still be open years. But have a, con have a conversation with your CPA like tomorrow. <laughs> Sounds like a great plan. Um, question number two from this person, where can we find farming tax experts like yourself. I operate an indoor farm growing microgreens. We did 200,000 in gross sales in 2023. We're a single member LLC with an S Corp election. I'm finding it difficult to find CPAs that know farm tax codes to optimize my taxes, especially as a niche producer of something like microgreens rather than row commodity animal products. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
the best way to do it is to either contact the North Carolina uh, NCA CPA, the North Carolina Association of CPAs. You can also contact the North Carolina Association of Tax, Tax Practitioners, NATP, so the North Carolina chapter, NATP, and, and see if they, they have some individuals. I used to know uh, a whole lot of folks in the four years that I've, uh, since I've left NC State, many of the people that I worked with and that I taught uh, and had uh, education events with have retired. Um, so, but I would strongly urge you to make a contact with either the NCA, CPA, and, and Debbie, I think that those resources yes. are available and you just have to get, but the thing that you have right now is everybody has, is in the midst of doing filing season. Yeah. Um, so extend may be your friend, meaning extend your, your LLC, which is taxed as a corporation, uh, extend your personal in, uh, returns, and that'll at least get you to September 15th for the corporation and October 15th for, for you, uh, as from a tax management and tax planning status, if, if you wanted to do that, that might help you, uh, get a little bit of help and folks might be more helpful say hey look uh, i got i already got my client load i'll get to you in may extend yeah and but and those organizations are going to be listed on the the handout that i send y'all i would also uh, suggest asking on my growing small farms listserv if you're not already on it you can email me to subscribe and people have definitely asked there uh, for recommendations on tax preparers that are used to working with small farms. Next question. If I'm given an animal as a gift, is that reported as income in any way? The operative word there is gift, and the answer to that is no. Okay. If a, va if a value-added product is a very small percentage of farm income, can it be included on Schedule F or, or, ha or has to be considered Schedule C? If it's a very small percentage, and like I said, my rule of thumb was 5 to 10%, put it on Schedule F to keep it simple. Okay. That's all. Does anybody, last chance here, because he's going to start in the few minutes that we have left, he's going to go over a few of your questions that you submitted in advance, which again, you're going to get as a handout tomorrow, but I'm giving you all last chance to type in any questions in the chat, any live questions. Um, otherwise, Guido, why don't you be picking out a few questions if okay. you want to highlight? Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead, Guido. One, one individual asked, depreciation and amortization, what's the difference? Well, both are used to calculate business deductions on Form 4562. Uh, depreciation generally starts either mid-year, mid-quarter, or mid-month. Uh, mid-month is uh, for real estate uh, buildings. Uh, where amortization is capitalized, for example, if you're going to do a fertilizer and you apply it, then it starts at mid-month and then it goes, both of them get recovered over a, uh, an agreed upon period of time, meaning that for depreciation, there's three, five, seven, 10, 15, 20, 20, uh, seven and a half uh, and 39 year lives to recover at, uh, those assets. So it's, they're very similar. There's just slight nuances in calculations. One big question, is land of a farm depreciated or amortized? No, land is not depreciated or amortized. It is permanent. And land generally over time appreciates in value. So it does not decline in value. It doesn't rust away. It doesn't become obsolete. So that's why it doesn't do that. Uh, okay, I have a single land holding single member LLC that rents land to the farm operating single member LLC. I used to report both entities as Schedule F on our joint form. Should I do a Schedule F for the LLC that's farming? Yes, you would use Schedule F for the farm return. How do I report the income expenses for the land holding? Well, that's the rental business, that's, and that is going to be Schedule E 
supplemental income, you'd use part uh, page one to report the income and then any property taxes or repairs or whatever is is uh, recorded to uh, to that. But if you if you're related parties, then what I would suggest you use is have a written lease between the operating farm and the landlord LLC, the rent be at fair market value and be modeled after the Martin case. The Martin case is a relatively recent case, but the guts of that case is if the rent is negotiated as arm's length, fair market value of the rent. So if, if land is renting for $100 an acre, then pay $100 an acre and also state that the landlord is not required to materially participate. In doing so, the rent is rent and then not subject to self-employment tax. And that's the reason, that's the, the tax court holding of the Martin case. And that's a really, really important case uh, to, to be aware of. Um, one here I want to look at, and I made mention uh, last uh, last time, it was mentioned that the difference between tool and supply versus equipment was the value of $2,500. If it was below that value, you could put it off as an expense. Okay, so looking at the repair regulations, Congress passed a $2,500 safe harbor that has to be a written accounting policy that states that the business was making the election to treat items which would have a useful life greater than one year, thus depreciable, but they're gonna be treated as an expense because they're less than $2,500. Therefore, anything less than or up to 2,500 bucks can be deducted as ordinary and necessary expense. The key is that you need to have a written accounting policy that says that this is the election that you're taking relative to these, these items. A follow-up question was, what about, for example, parts of a fence, wire post, nails, et cetera? Each individually may be $2,500, put, but put together, they're more than $2,500. Well, the question there is, are you building a new fence? If you're building a new fence, then you have to capitalize all of that cost until that fence is completed and put into service. So let's say you've done that and you spent $6,500 on this fence. Then you're gonna list that fence as a depreciable asset. And then it is eligible for section 179 expensing. So you would capitalize, determine the end value, put it into service, and then you use section 179 to expense. That's the correct order of things to do. Uh, and then you correctly deduct that. If it's repairs, if it's just simply repairs, I'm buying some wire, I'm buying some posts, I'm putting in repairs. Those are ordinary and necessary in and of themselves. So the question really is, what is your intent? Are you building new fence or are you repairing? And if you're building new fence, you need to capitalize, and then you need to depreciate that fence under the depreciation rules. Uh, we've already answered that one indirectly. Oh, one is here. This one's really important. Uh, are you allowed to write off farmer's market membership fees, farmer's market stall fees, and the fees that we pay on credit card and debit card sales made through Square? And the answer is yes. Those would all be ordinary and necessary because you are taking your products to the market and you've got a transactions cost or you have a, a capital cost to be able to get there. And you would put those uh, generally on line 32. You could just put those as market fees or credit card fees. You, if you want to put it at one item, that's fine. But you've got several lines. I would put market fees and then I would put credit card fees from Square uh, on that. They're deductible expenses. They're part of the cost of doing business. I like this one. Uh, and this will be the last question, uh, unless something pops up. 
I've got livestock guardian dogs. They protect my chickens from predators. They live with the chickens 24 seven. Uh, I deduct their veterinary expenses, taxes. If my vet or feed store decides to charge a service fee of 3%, if I pay using a credit card, can I include the cost of the fee uh, uh, as an expense? Yes, just like I did, it's just part, it's a transactions cost. It would be a feed cost, it would be a vet cost. You just throw, uh, throw that all there, so. Um, but Debbie, I notice I'm just a little bit past seven o'clock here on my time. So we're a little bit past eight there. Yep. Uh, I would encourage folks to kind of review some of my answers that I provided uh, to, to the questions. So I'm going to shut up and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Guido. Um, we thank everybody for attending tonight. And just as a reminder, I'll be sending an email tomorrow morning with a new Zoom link. Don't try to use the same Zoom link and new handouts. Um, take a look at those. And we will see y'all back again on uh, Wednesday night at six o'clock. And remember that one we expect to run a little bit past 8 p.m. our time. So just be prepared for that. If you're not able to make it past eight, you can just watch the recording. So thanks for coming and have a good night. Good night all.